Hi and welcome to another uh, online instalment of our sermons at Church on the Green and uh, we're looking at Acts 25 to 26. We're not going to read the whole thing now. I'd encourage you to pause the video and read that for yourself and then come back and, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll look at God's word. Acts 25 to 26 then. I wonder when you consider it, what do you think progress looks like for Christians? What does progress look like for the wider church? What does it look like to be successful and what does failure look like? Are we moving forward in what we're doing? How do we measure that? This morning we're going to look at Paul's ministry and we're going to ask that same question. What does progress look like for Paul? Is there any encouragement to be taken from his circumstances? Or actually, has he just reached the end of the road? Put it another way, is his ministry dead now that he's locked up? It's been two years and the governor, Felix, seems to have thrown away the key. Acts 24 verse 27 seems to offer a glimmer of hope. When two years have passed, Felix was succeeded by Porcius Festus. Felix has had all that time and he clears, as he clears off his desk, getting ready for the next governor to come in, surely this is a reasonable moment for him to release Paul. After all, if he was keeping him in jail so that he could call on him and listen to him, then Felix won't be here soon. So why would he hang on to him? Sadly, and albeit understandably, Felix is more concerned with the Jews surrounding him than with this one man locked up in prison. So we read in the second half of that verse, because Felix wanted to grant a favour to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. Now you can imagine Paul's partners in the gospel on a roller coaster with him as they pray, seeing reason after reason seem to seem hopeful and then having their hopes dashed. We thought the Sanhedrin would release him, but they didn't. We thought Felix would release him straight away, but he didn't. So maybe he'll release him later, and yet he hasn't. Hope is being eroded. But there is new hope. A new governor, a new chance to secure releases. Porcius Festus, a man with the authority to release Paul in an instant if he wanted to. So what's going to happen? Well, Judea was a hotbed for sedition and unrest, a place where the Roman Empire clashed with the Jewish religion. So top of Porcius Festus's to-do list as the incoming Roman governor of Judea is to seek the peace of the province. And that means seeking peace with the Sanhedrin, the Jewish council. So he heads out from Caesarea, the administrative capital of Judea, to Jerusalem, the Jewish religious capital, and he meets with them. What are they going to want? Well, there's a whole city to govern, so surely the, the idea of having a new governor to petition is an exciting one for them. They may have brought many demands on that day, but the one that Luke records is their request that Paul is brought to Jerusalem to stand trial there. Why? Well, we're told in verse 3, they're plotting to murder him before he reaches Jerusalem. That is the act of a group who know that they don't have a case, but want to get their own way anyway. They just want rid of Paul. Does Festus know about the previous plot to assassinate Paul? His life hangs in the balance at that moment. How will Festus answer these requests of the Jews? Well, he doesn't want to deny the Jews, that would damage his peace efforts, but he doesn't want to simply hand Paul over either, so he agrees to have a pre-trial, if you like. And the Sanhedrin are invited to come and make their case in Caesarea. It doesn't look encouraging, does it? We're off on the same loop that we seem to have been round again and again over the past few weeks. Jewish accusations, Roman dithering and no solid outcome. Where's it going to end? Festus and the Jews meet again in Caesarea. The Jewish prosecution make their accusations and Paul makes his defence, which is simple as to say, chapter 25, verse 8, I've done nothing wrong against the Jewish law or against the temple or against Caesar. But Festus still wants to keep the Jewish authorities happy. So he asks Paul in verse 9, 
Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on these charges? I'll take responsibility, he says. I'll be the judge. It'll be a Roman court just in Jerusalem. Now, Paul is left with a terrible choice. If he agrees, then he can be pretty confident he's going to be murdered before he gets there. If he didn't know that there was a plot this time, he must surely remember that there was a plot just a couple of years ago and must suspect that something similar must be underway now. If he refuses, though, he'll come across as obstructive and in doing so, he'll damage his case before Festus. So what can he do? Does he say yes? Does he say no? Well, actually, he does neither. He makes an amazing decision, an extreme option. As a Roman citizen, he has the right to appeal to be heard by Caesar. It's a right that cannot be denied any Roman citizen, and it's the equivalent of appealing to the highest court. It's a desperate move. What a moment we've reached. That the best option open to Paul is not to seek the judgment of the court of God's people, but the court of Nero, an emperor already known to be corrupt and intoxicated by his power, an emperor known to react badly to having his time wasted. Has all hope gone? Surely Paul's ministry is at an end now. What possible effect could he have? Well, as we've seen time and time again over the past weeks and months, God's plans don't always appear to be working out. But that doesn't mean that they aren't working out. These are plans in a broken world full of sinful people. Plans that God works out sometimes with his obedient servants, but often amongst his disobedient rebels. Humanly speaking, Paul's request to go to Rome to stand before Nero is utterly desperate and a last-ditch attempt to salvage something, anything. But now, as we look back and we're able to see what God was really doing, we see that Paul's decision to appeal to Caesar was the very decision that was going to take him to Rome, take him to the centre of that mighty empire, give him a voice that would cause the gospel to echo to every corner of the earth. Those were God's plans. Paul endured murder plots, imprisonment and trials, but through them he was led to appeal to Rome. And through that seemingly last-ditch appeal, the gospel went forth and Paul's ministry to the Gentiles went forth in ways that it never had before. It's not the first time we've seen this in the Bible. Joseph, the subject of treachery and a plot to murder, thrown in a well, dragged out, sold into slavery, accused, imprisoned, and through it all, sent to Egypt and able to reunite the family of God and save them from famine that would have destroyed them to be brought back into the promised land. What about Moses, the unexpected slave survivor growing in Pharaoh's palace to be rejected by his own people, outcast, drawn back to lead them, grumbled at, rebelled against and finally barred from going into the promised land? And yet he led the people who would enter the promised land on one day. It didn't look like success, but it would be in time. What about David, the shepherd who becomes king only to fall foul to sin and have a royal family that tears itself apart? It looks like failure. And yet that same David is the ancestor of Mary who gives birth to a baby boy in a manger in Bethlehem. A boy who'll grow up to know the rejection of his own people, a murder plot carried out through false accusation, mock trial and beating and the lowest of lows, crucifixion. The Son of God crucified, dying, dead. It looked so much like failure. And yet that plan from the beginning sees sin conquered and death destroyed. It sees a new resurrection world where God's people can be at one with him and enjoy him forever. And so Paul appeals to Rome, not because it's a last ditch option, although it may have felt that way for Paul on that day. But in reality, and this is a greater reality going on, because God had planned that this is how his servant would be enabled to fulfill the ministry that God had called him to. God had planned that this is how he was going to build his church on that day and over those coming months and years. 
that's not to say that we can just sit back and leave it to God and say, well, whatever, because God will work it out. No, God includes our wisdom and godly counsel and godly planning in his plans. They're part of how he does things. But what it is to say is that if we've made godly plans and they've come to nothing seemingly, and if everything feels like it's falling apart, if we feel like we're forced into a corner, well, then we need to recognise that everything is not lost. Let me take an example. Let me take the example of the church in the UK and many around the world right now that have been forced to stop meeting together in their buildings. That looked like a great loss for the gospel, didn't it? How can we reach out when we're not meeting together? How can we continue to gather people in when we're not meeting together? We found ourselves in a corner. And yet God's plans stand. And as God has worked out his plans, we've seen people gathered in from other parts of the country, from other parts of the world to join with us. We've seen that God is still doing his work. We are still a part of God's work in history to send his gospel to the nations, lockdown or no lockdown, to see many saved. The Great Commission is no less great because circumstances are difficult right now. And there will never be a time before Christ comes again where God is not working out his promises and his plans in us and around us. So have confidence, brothers and sisters. In every circumstance, trust that God always carries out his promises. Let's pray, shall we? Lord God, circumstances around us change sometimes so quickly that we struggle to keep tabs on what is going on. We struggle to measure what is success and what is failure, what has gone well and what has gone badly. Yet, yet in it all, Lord, you're working out your plans. Lord, we may struggle to catch up, to keep up, but you never struggle to work out your promises. Help us then, Lord, not to trust in our own ability to perceive what is happening. Help us to trust in your greatness in the God of the Bible, in our Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour, the one who was crucified and died and was resurrected. And so now, Lord, we live in that resurrection hope. Lord, we pray you would help us to live as disciples in the knowledge and assurance of your love and your grace. Help us to reach out in confidence that however things look today, Lord, you have set true hope before us of eternity. Help us in all these things to be your disciples, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And we'll see you again soon.